the gun lobby and Republicans have been pulled further to the right. And, and that is in large part because gun extremism has become an organizing principle. If you go to back to Waco when the NRA started using this anti-government rhetoric and used it really as a fundraising tool, what it became was part of their political platform because it was so successful. And then that was adopted by the right wing. And, and I'm sure you saw the study that came out last week that said about 22 percent of Republican lawmakers belong to some kind of right wing group, whether it's Proud Boys or, or Oath Keepers or QAnon. And, and really, gun extremism now is the central organizing principle, whether it's anti-trans or anti-woman or anti-abortion, whatever it is, guns get people in the door. Gun extremism has become, it, it's totemic. It's a cultural signifier. It is a way to get people in the door to recruit them, to raise money off of them, and to excite them on a whole host of issues. That's what we've seen across the country. The Door Brothers, right? They are these extremists who, who are actually brothers who have really gone to state houses, mostly in the Midwest, and they've made an incredible amount of money recruiting people who become members and become donors or through Facebook ads, but they get them in this, um, in, they recruit them into their base, and then they talk about gun extremism, and then they move it out to other issues. And, and that is something we could not have predicted 10 years ago, was that this would really become a galvanizing issue for the right wing group, uh, it, lawmakers and extremists. The real issue with the assault weapons ban that was in place until 2004 was that a lot of it was cosmetic. And so you could have the exact identical rifle with minor modifications. It still behaved like the, its counterpart. But just because of these minor cosmetic modifications, it wasn't included in the ban. So it wasn't the best ban that, that we could have put in place. Um, but, but the ban seems to have worked, right? And there are researchers who, you know, they, they really haven't come out and said definitively that they felt the ban was effective. But certainly if you look at the data, it does seem to tell the story of reduced gun deaths. Between 2009 and 2018, the five deadliest mass shooting incidents in America all involved the use of assault weapons. What is causing gun crime, gun death in this country, is easy access to guns. We know that because, first of all, we can compare ourselves to other peer nations, even nations that have high rates of civilian gun ownership. And we can see that we have about a 26 times higher gun homicide rate. The other thing we can do is look at our country. Because we don't have the federal laws that we should, we have essentially a patchwork quilt of state laws, some strong, some incredibly weak. I know it sounds intuitive, but when you look at the map of America, the states that have strong gun laws have much less gun death, and the states that have weak gun laws have much more gun death. But data actually shows us this, right? We don't have to make laws based on anecdote or emotion. If I don't think raising the age limit to uh, you can buy a beer when you're 21, Sudafed, cigarettes, uh, obviously a semi-automatic rifle at 21 seems like the bare minimum age uh, for owning a weapon of war. And so that, in my mind, is not restricting gun rights. It's simply applying common sense to who can have them in this country. Same with closing loopholes. Right. The fact that, for example, right now, stalkers and dating partners are not included in the definition of a prohibited purchaser in our federal domestic violence laws, only a spouse or someone you're cohabitating with or someone you've had children with. So there are a lot of different loopholes they could go in and close, um, but they would make a significant life saving difference. And really, that at the end of the day is what we hope for the outcome to be something that will save lives. First of all, I don't want anyone who hasn't spent a day in my middle school classroom telling me what I need to do about gun violence. No, 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 no. I want you to think that through. I'm a middle school teacher with middle level learners. And if you haven't had one in your home, yeah, if you have, you know what I mean. And we have someone who is armed with an assault weapon. So I am then going to be expected to get my firearm out of a safe storage location, which is another thing, another area we're pushing Ethan's law as well. Um, and um, I'm supposed to stop an assault weapon? And that's what we're asking educators to do now? No, that's not only not okay and not realistic and not possible. That is not what educators are in the classroom to do. They are in their classrooms to teach 
and nurture uh, students so that they are prepared for that level, next level of their educational journey and for life. It is not to pull out a gun and make a split second decision about whether they're going to shoot someone or take someone's life. That is not okay that we are focusing on that distraction instead of passing the common sense gun laws that we all know will prevent these deaths. And by the way, it's a deliberate attempt to divert attention away from the failings of some of our po elected politicians from investing in our schools from respecting educators. You know, we've talked a lot about the education shortage and what have we done about that? Except having lived through two years of a pandemic that just put so much more of a burden on educators, having to step up and stand in gaps that, were, that have been fueled by the inequities in every single social system that determine whether our students come to school ready to learn every day. And then to say, um, to threaten verbally or physically or threaten the jobs of teachers who are teaching the curriculum, which includes the complete and truthful history of this country. And not just that, instead of talking about banning assault weapons, which is what they should be talking about, they're talking about banning books. These people who they refuse to pass um, uh, education spending bills that pay them in a way that's commensurate with the important work they do in this society. These are the people who are talking about, no, 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 we will not be distracted. Can we just put in perspective for a second, the fact that there was an armed guard in Buffalo who because the shooter had body armor, his handgun was no match for a teen with a semi-automatic rifle and a death wish. And then in Uvalde, 19 police officers, a school resource officer, the border patrol, and, and he couldn't be stopped. And, and yet our lawmakers are looking to, to kindergarten teachers to think that they can do the job. It's, it's despicable. Most of their money uh, goes for lobbying. That's what they've been really since the late 70s when there was a coup within their own organization um, among extremists who wanted to turn it into a lobbying organization because they were opposed to gun legislation passed in the late 60s. You go back to 1999, you can watch Wayne LaPierre, the CEO of the NRA, on YouTube saying, we do not support guns in schools in any way, shape, or form. And also, we support a background check on every gun sale. I mean, they did want to and helped establish background checks on licensed gun sales. Their goal was, at the time, there weren't that many people carrying guns in public. So they wanted to establish a permitting system by which many more people would buy guns and they would be carrying in public, but they would have to go through this permitting system. Very weak in some states, very strong in others, but typically a background check and some level of safety training required. They got everything they wanted, right? They got the, the background check system and then they went state by state and got the permits in place. They even have something called um, reciprocity where some states will allow you to take your permit from another state into their state. Everything was going great. In fact, it was going so great that they realized who needs permits? There will be even more guns in more places and more gun sales if you can just carry a hidden loaded handgun in public with no background check required and no training required. Let's lower the barrier that is required to have a handgun or even a long gun and to concealed carry or even open carry in public. And now their priority is something called permitless carry. The NRA has passed it now in 21 states, most recently in the state of Texas um, and, and, and several other states this legislative session. And it does allow you to carry a hidden loaded handgun in public with no background check, no training, no permitting. And there are these tapes that were made and released not too long ago, they were actually made after the Columbine shooting. And it was a conversation among NRA executives about what do we do? There's been this shooting in Colorado, we're about to have our annual meeting down the street. How should we respond? And several times in history, the NRA has been given the choice of backing down and kind of coming to the middle with mainstream America or doubling down. And I think all they had to do was sort of look at their demographic, which is you know a white man over the age of 60, that's who was buying handguns at the time, or even long guns. And they knew they had to start marketing guns to women, to people of color, to children, in order to inculcate the next generation or next group of gun buyers. So in these tapes, it's Marion Hammer. And if you don't know who she is, she's a very, very powerful NRA lobbyist in Florida. 
She's in her 80s. She's been there forever. A lot of people call her Florida's shadow governor. And she has always been the one to say, never back down, never give an inch. You're going to show up at this Denver annual meeting and you're going to have Charlton Heston say, you can pry my gun for my cold dead hands. And it's really been that orthodoxy that and that ideology that has led the NRA ever since. It's why two weeks after the Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy, when we all thought surely the NRA will come to the middle, that they actually said, you know, it only thing stops a, a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So there's there's no reward to them for compromising. And because they're a special interest, it's difficult to put that in place. They really do want to scare you into siding with them, no matter what the consequences are with your own base. I think an interesting example is Colorado. So after the Aurora shooting um, in 2012, and then the Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy, Governor Hickenlooper in Colorado actually passed very strong, sweeping gun safety legislation. There was such a huge backlash because at the time I would say, you know, Colorado is still pretty purple, but it was even more purple then. And what did the NRA do? And, and along with a group called the Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, which is another important point, every single state has its own version of the NRA, and it's usually to the right of the NRA, which certainly Rocky Mountain Gun Group is. They went in, they worked hard to recall two lawmakers who voted for background checks in an off-cycle election. So it makes it much easier to recall someone because there's low uh, interest, low, people aren't paying attention, and you can get people to sign petitions. They recalled successfully two lawmakers. And that really did send a chill, and it was meant to, not just in Colorado, but across the whole country. And it was a really important lesson for us as a movement, which was when you win, you need to stick around and you need to protect the people who put their jobs on the line in order to get something across the finish line. So a couple of years later, we were able to pass sweeping gun reform legislation in Oregon. And no surprise, the NRA went in with the local gun group and tried to recall lawmakers again. But because we learned our lesson, they failed. The work that has been going on is to create momentum on the ground, to create the largest grassroots movement that's ever existed in this country on any issue and that can actually go toe to toe with the gun lobby. Now we can talk about why this right wing extremist agenda still has so much power, but let's be clear that the NRA is weaker than they've ever been. They're hemorrhaging political power and money. Meanwhile, we are stronger than we've ever been. And I do think we are also closer than we've ever been to finally moving the log jam. But I am hopeful and I would, I would posit that discussions are probably going better than they've gone in the entire decade that I've been doing this work when I started Moms to Me in Action. About a quarter of all Democrats in Congress had an A rating from the NRA. Today, none do. That in itself is a political seismic shift, right? That's the work we've been doing. And we have to keep doing what we've been doing now for 10 years, which is to show up in city councils and in school board meetings and in state houses and even in corporate boardrooms. And we have to demand change.